Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Greg Edmondson, and today I would like to talk to you all about user retention. So what exactly is user retention? Some of you might be asking. Well, you can kind of guess by you know, the, the phrase itself, but it is the ability to retain users over a certain period of time. Um, and I think many of us have also heard of user acquisition. Well, this is basically the other side of that same coin as user acquisition. You know, if you gain users, if you acquire users, then you have to retain them after that. Otherwise, there's no point in acquiring them. <laughs> um, so just really quick, before we get started, some general statistics uh, about user retention rates. Um, now, do note that these rates will change based on the genre of your application. Uh, these will change based on the environment that you are building for. So these rates are slightly different for Apple, for instance. Um, but yeah, user retention is usually uh, measured by three metrics. Your one-day retention rate, which on Android is average 26%. Your one-week or seven-day retention rate, which on average is 11%. And finally, your 30-day retention rate, which on Android is on average 6%. Um, so remember, do keep in mind, uh, these will change slightly. These will be slightly higher or lower, actually higher, uh, for Apple and for different genres of applications. Um, so yeah, what are some common methods of increasing user retention? Well, <laughs> there is one very controversial method uh, called email blasting, and we'll be diving into all of these in a moment. Um, so yeah, next there is betas. Um, which especially if you are into video games, I'm sure you've heard of betas. Um, next, we have pop-ups or push notifications. Again, uh, a bit controversial like email blasting, but you know, very, very common. Um, and lastly, and I'm just going to say right now, but I'm a little biased, this is my favorite, is gamification. So yeah, let's get started. So what is email blasting exactly? Um, email blasting is when you... <laughs> essentially just send out like 40,000 emails all at once to all of your user base or, you know, to specific targeted users. Um, so I think reasons you would use that is one is that it's great for customized marketing. So if you have a huge database of users and you know what products they fought in the past, what products they've looked at, um, you can basically target them with emails and, uh, you know, target specific demographics and just send out 10,000 emails at a time. That is mm, great. Um, next, it is very well suited for user conversion, which means changing a non-paying or non-interacting user into an interacting or paying user. Um, so there are not many methods of, uh, I guess, communicating with your users that can have them, uh, you know, with the initial uh, notification and get them to actually having that product in their cart or, you know, downloading your app in literally two clicks. Like that's insane. That is unheard of in other forms of, I guess, marketing or uh, uh, user communication. Um, you know, you can send out an email and again, in two clicks, they could have uh, that item in their shopping cart. That's, that's major. That's huge. That's great. Um, so next it is cheap. It is remarkably cheap to send out massive amounts of emails to people. Um, it's, yeah, that's, that's huge. And lastly, it is great for driving impulsive users. <laughs> so this sounds a little, uh, I don't know, shady, I guess, but for instance, if you've ever gone to a supermarket and literally right next to the, the cash register, they have, you know, a bunch of gum and candy, uh, and you just think like, eh, it's 50 cents. Why wouldn't I get a Snickers? It's the exact same thing. You send out an email, uh, they see, I don't know, a pair of hiking shoes on sale for 50% off. They've never gone hiking in their lives, but they see it's cheap, they're impulsive, and yeah, so it's great. It's really, really good for driving impulsive users, um, which, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, so statistics, 92% uh, of internet users have at least, note that wording, at least one email account. Um, it is up to 40 times more effective than social media marketing. So I'm sure plenty of us know people who have, you know, recently been getting off Facebook, getting off Twitter, even, I guess, I almost said Google. Uh, but yeah, so, but 
I, I think that no, nobody here knows somebody who, or not many people know, know somebody who is like throwing away their email account. Um, you know, everybody uses email and has email. Um, so also roughly 89% of marketers consider email marketing campaigns a success. So yeah, I guess the data kind of shows that they are good. Um, however, you must be careful. Doing this incorrectly can really, really annoy your users. So be careful that you're not spamming emails every day and every other day. Um, and nextly, you need to really target your users. Um, if you have a 50-year-old man named John, you wouldn't necessarily want to send him emails maybe even once a week or once a month about, I don't know, like ballet shoes for 10-year-old girls. I, unless he has shown an interest in buying such products in the past, uh, target users. You really need to target your users. Um, and also you need to beware of spam filters. If you send out 10,000 emails without ever having contacted any of these people before, they're gonna wind up in the spam uh, folder. So how can you get started? Uh, you can use something called MailChimp or Mailgun. Uh, these are very, very common and popular services among especially like e-commerce. Um, yeah, or you can use uh, the Google Suite. Um, yeah. So popular services. So we have MailChimp, which has scaling plans. It starts for free for up to 2,000 contacts and 10,000 emails per month. So literally anybody could do this if you sign up. Uh, 10,000 emails per month. Um, and their next plan starts at $9.99 a month uh, for 500 contacts and uh, a certain amount of emails per contact. And it scales up to 50,000 contacts and 500,000 emails monthly. That's crazy. Um, and next we have Mailgun, uh, which is, it starts at $35 a month, up to 50,000 emails and $80 a month for 100,000 emails a month, plus enhanced tools and support. So uh, yeah, so let's look at MailChimp really quick. All right, so here we are in uh, my MailChimp dashboard. And uh, let's say I just created an account. I don't have any uh, contacts in this account yet. So I'm going to click on my audience and let's see all contacts. And I can add contacts, import contacts. So let's say you have yet to use a uh, uh, service like this. You've just been saving everything here in like a Google doc or something, you know? Um, you can literally just copy and paste uh, a CSV or a spreadsheet of, uh, of users, of contacts. And you can just copy and paste that directly into your MailChimp account. Um, as you can see, I was kind of running out of test names. Um, here, let's, just in case, let's update any existing contacts. Um, let's not give them any tags. And here we go. Finalize import, uh, complete import. Let's view our contacts. So yeah, here you have it, test five, test six, test seven, test eight, and my actual email address. Um, don't, don't send me any emails to that unless they're uh, you know interesting <laughs> job offers, that's fine. Um, so yeah, now we can take all of these uh, emails, all these contacts that we just created, and we can create just extremely easily. Let's click on a template um, and we can create an email to blast out to all of these people. So let's, we're gonna share some big news, I guess. Let's test out with this template. And these are all pre-made templates for email blasting. Um, share your big news. Uh, apps on the way. Yay, yeah, cool. Save and close. Um, and as you can see right here, we have preview and test, uh, send a test email. So you can send this email to yourself or any number of uh, test addresses to kind of see how it will appear on the other side. So yeah, you're not just going in there blind. Um, so let's just cancel out of this for a moment. And one last thing that I would like to show about MailChimp is, again, it's a very like all-in-one kind of package. Uh, they also have a website domain hosting. So you can see I have my sample biz right here and I have my home page. I can click edit page, uh, big mood spa, get moody. Uh, yeah, and you can just very, very easily integrate your mailing with a uh, home page through MailChimp. So if you are looking at starting up um, a home page as well as a uh, email blasting, MailChimp is my recommendation. So next we have Gmail. Uh, it's generally free to use, which is great, but spam filters don't like it. 
Uh, so if you decide to use Gmail, uh, you can use a plugin like Gmas to get started, but do be ready for all of your emails to get caught in a spam filter. So uh, yeah, be careful about that. Um, so our next form of uh, user uh, retention is betas. So again, I'm sure that most of us have heard of what a beta is before, but they are where you allow a small selection of users to use your application prior to releasing it to the public. So there are two kinds of betas commonly used. There are open and closed. Open, anybody can participate. See, we have grandma, we got uh, Santa Claus, you know, and everyone's in there. Uh, and now a closed beta is a little more selective. Um, only select users are able to participate. Like, you know, this hardcore ninja cat, he's a hardcore user. Um, so yeah, benefits of holding betas is that you can gain user loyalty before even launching your app. Like, how cool is that? Your app isn't even open to the public yet. And you're already having users, like, you know, you're gaining user loyalty. Uh, it's, yeah, I feel like it kind of spells itself out, but that's huge. That's great. Um, and you can also use this as a chance for pre-release market research. So you can see what your users like, what they don't like. Um, yeah, you can get some market research in there. So again, this is very common with video games. As you can see on the left, you have a very popular game that's currently in closed beta called uh, Escape from Tarkov. And then on the right, you have the uh, open beta for New World, which is a large game uh, being developed by Amazon. But we'll go into these a little bit more in a moment. So why would you choose a closed beta or an open beta, right? Like why would you choose one over the other? So closed betas, uh, you will have fewer but more dedicated participants. So if you have to pay money to take part in this beta, then you're going to be a bit more invested than just you know, random user A who just downloaded it off of the App Store. Um, also, as a developer, you can gain extra funding from early adopters and pre-purchasers. So you know, this is kind of a source of funding early on. Um, and because they are closed and users will generally know what they're getting into, you can begin earlier in production. Uh, however, if you're going into this for, uh, say, searching for bugs, uh, is maybe one goal of a beta, uh, you will generally find fewer bugs because you have fewer users and you'll have less data. Um, so next, we have open betas. You will have more participants. You will get more data. However, they can garner bad attention from non-core users. So remember, you have Grandma and Santa Claus taking part in your beta, and maybe they're just using it like they would use any you know, already released app. Um, and yeah, they find a bug and they're like, wow, this app, this app stinks. This is terrible. Uh, so that's, you know, one thing that can happen with open betas. So uh, generally you want to start later in production. So, you know, there are fewer bugs, there are fewer issues uh, to garner that bad attention. So I, I touched on Tarkov, Escape from Tarkov a little bit earlier. Um, and as you can see on the, like, the, the screen up to the right of the uh, image, of the game image, I just wish Tarkov had in-game voice communication. So it is an extremely like, hardcore military shooter, and it doesn't have voice communication. That seems like a huge feature missing, but because it's in a closed beta, all of the users are just, they accept that, and they say it's an upcoming feature. So they don't really knock it for that. And you can see, reviewed on PC, 4.5 out of 5. Oh, that's a great score. Um, someone down beneath that also said, uh, again, they're pointing out that it has flaws. You need a pretty beefy PC to run this game at 60 FPS. Uh, it's brutally hard. I suck at this game. I give it 8 out of 10. So because these people know what they're getting into, uh, you know, they'll be generally a bit more kind with their rating um, if the product is already at a base level. right? So next, we have uh, New World which is in open beta. And it's not to say that you won't find good reviews of open world, but literally just yesterday as I was watching YouTube, I found this uh, video to the right, New World. Is there any adventure left? So again, it's an open beta. So we have tons and tons of users coming in and playing it. And people are making guides and reviews and all this before it's even available, like fully available as though it was the full game. So before the game's even out, there's so much information out there that it's kind of going against the entire concept of the game itself. Um, you know, kind of that mystery that they're going for. Uh, and also you can see in that uh, screenshot down to the, on the bottom, um, everything else was atrocious. The combat was slow and clunky. So again, it's, 
this genre of game typically will have slower combat. Uh, they feel a bit clunky. That's kind of part of the genre. But again, you have just everybody in here playing this game. And so they're criticizing it as though it was the full release. So yeah, next, let's talk a little bit about push notifications or pop-ups. So two things that you need to keep in mind with push notifications are, I guess, two major questions are who should use them and how can you use them effectively? So I'm just going to say right now, pretty much everybody should be using them. <laughs> um, that's pretty much everybody should be using all of these. Um, however, uh, some best use cases for push notifications are time-sensitive uh, notifications. So for instance, if you order something off of Uber Eats, uh, everybody is happy when they see, oh, it'll be there in five minutes. Uh, we're making your food right now. So these time-sensitive notifications are extremely good uses of push notifications. Um, next, uh, they are great when they are customized or targeted. So kind of like with emails, you don't want to be sending, uh, let's say someone's using Duolingo and they've been studying uh, Japanese. You don't want to send them questions in Spanish and say, hey, why don't you study Spanish today? That's irrelevant. You need to customize or target them. Uh, next, you need to diversify your notifications. So these will be uh, more frequently sent than email notifications. So if you're sending the exact same message 10 times a day, that's a great way to get your app uninstalled. <laughs> you need to really diversify these notifications. And lastly, your notifications need to be actionable. So what is actionable? What is actionable? So let's look at Duolingo. I love Duolingo's notifications. They're great. So uh, one, we have leading sentences. Uh, what does, I don't know why I chose Korean because I can't read Korean, but <laughs> what does that mean? Practice now. Uh, time for Korean, you're 50%. So, you know, they're starting off with a question. What does this mean? Get in here and practice. Next, actionable writing. So do you see the ending of all of these? Practice now. Um, it's time for your daily Korean lesson. So, you know, it's very like commanding almost. And the user knows exactly what you want them to do. And lastly, uh, Duolingo is great about this, but we're holding the user accountable. <laughs> so with, uh, with number three uh, on the very bottom right there, hi, it's Duo, it's time for your daily Korean lesson. Uh, take five minutes now to complete it. If the user does not go in and do their Korean lesson, like, it, it almost, it's guilting the user in a sense, <laughs> because it takes five minutes. And so what, if I don't do that, that means I can't spare five minutes to, you know, study Korean. So it's kind of, it's setting the accountability on the user themselves to use your app. They feel obligated to use it. Um, so some stats, um, again, about Duolingo is that they saw a 2% increase in their one week user retention after implementing a proprietary algorithm for deciding which notifications to send users. That's a lot of words. But basically what that means is, uh, again, they're sending different notifications every six hours or so. You know, they don't just send the same exact notification every single time. They are tailored to which notifications the users interact with, uh, what languages the user is studying, et cetera. Um, so they're very, very tailored notifications. So by implementing this, they saw a 2% increase in the one week user retention rate. Um, so nextly, we have computer software uh, can also use these, but you need to be extremely careful because uh, this is something called magics. Um, not to necessarily call out magics in their uh, practices, but if you install magic software, they will occasionally have like several times a day, occasionally, uh, these pop-ups show on the bottom of your screen and be like, hey, we have 50% off this pack that we're selling on our store, come and buy it. Um, I was using magics in the past and I uninstalled because of those notifications. As you can see um, on the bottom left, there are some Reddit users talking about this great deal on magic software. And literally the first comment is, don't fall for this, as though this is a trap because of those notifications. So, uh, you know, if you're developing for computers, for desktops, be careful. Okay, and lastly, let's talk a little bit about gamification. So gamification is essentially when you add goals or you add gamey elements to things that are generally not enjoyable. <laughs> generally not fun. Um, so yeah, gamification, it's a very, very, very broad category. And that's part of what makes it so much fun, honestly, is, you know, the use, not only the usage, but the implementation 
is a lot of fun. Gamification is it's cool. Um, if you are not using it, you need to use it. So who uses gamification, right? Like if you're not making a video game, then how can you use gamification and some random app? Like who is using this? So everybody's using it. Like eh, literally everywhere you look, once you know what to look for, everybody is using gamification in some way or another. So Reddit, again, I've been using Reddit a lot. I use Reddit a lot. Um, they have karma. Uh, they have achievements on their profiles, et cetera. They, they use gamification all the time. And that's part of what makes it so much fun to use. Um, Duolingo, they have leaderboards. They have, oh, Duolingos. Mm, they use gamification amazingly. And again, that's part of what makes Duolingo so much better and so much more popular than uh, something like Drops, for instance, is another uh, language learning application. But yeah, it's Duolingo's use of gamification is spot on. Next, we have Strava, which is an exercise uh, tracking application. Um, they make exercising fun. Like, that's, that's awesome. That's, I feel like that's pretty hard to do. Um, even your banks, your credit cards, they use gamification to an extent. Like literally everybody uses gamification. So again, with Reddit, uh, you can see, uh, I have 10,001 karma, um, 609 post karma. So I'm, you know, doing pretty good for myself. Those are actually pretty low for the fact that you can see my trophies. I have a six year club. I've been on this site for six years. That's a long time. I have a verified email. They have gamified verifying your email like my god that's that's crazy that's insane that's awesome uh next we have duolingo look at the leagues they have bronze silver gold sapphire ruby emerald emerald i can't read amethyst pearl obsidian diamond if anyone here has played league of legends for instance like these sound like these sound like video game leagues but this is for studying that's awesome or like even my account i have the wildfire achievement reach a seven day streak i have the sage achievement the scholar achievement like <laughs> you know this isn't just studying anymore this is a game i'm leveling myself up by leveling myself up um yeah duolingo's gamification is great uh next we have banks uh for instance i use rakuten in japan uh they have the silver the base card and then you have the pink card which is i guess just i think anybody can uh, get that one, but you have the Rakuten Gold card, for instance, and your Premium card, and I think other uh, banks have Platinum cards, and you know it's it's very gamified. Um, and lastly, you know this is a coding school and a coding channel, so we can't forget Code Wars. Um, ignore the fact that I'm only seven Q, <laughs> um, but you know they have uh, gamified studying programming, like that's so cool. And again, that's partially why Code Wars is so much more popular than certain other competitors. Um, and the other day I bought these earphones. I bought these earphones and upon uh, registering them for the warranty, I got this email saying that I reached level one. I don't even know what these levels do, but they are gamifying registering my earphones. Like that's, <laughs> everybody uses gamification and it's great. It's fantastic to use. Um, and here we have Strava. So again, you know, I, I like cycling a lot. Uh, so you can see my second fastest time on that uh, route that I was riding on, or I have trophies on my account. I have, uh, you know, all these different stats showing up. So I would like to uh, show, you know, I guess how we can make our own app. It's a really quick demo of how we could make our own app with gamification, how we could implement this into our own exercising app. So let's take Strava's already gamified systems to the next level with fantasy fitness. Um, so let's look again one last time. We have our Strava stats. We have our distance for each ride. We have the estimated average power. We have all these different stats. And personally, as a nerd, I love Skyrim. I love Morrowind Oblivion. I love all these, you know, uh, I guess like fantasy RPGs. This is gamey, but it's not gamey enough. You know, this doesn't really satisfy the nerd in me. I want... I want more fantasy and magic. So you can see on the right, we have ride, run, swim, hike, walk, alpines. We have so many different types of exercise here. So let's make those a little more fun. <laughs> so in our app in fantasy fitness, we're going to say, if you're out for a ride, you're going to level up your Lancer class. If you run, you're leveling up your rogue class. Swimming, uh, I went with water wizard. 
feel free to not use water wizard, but uh, yeah, like you see what I'm getting at. You can take all of these different uh, exercises and just by replacing the name, it's already for someone like me, a little more uh, enticing. It looks fun, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, you would have a different class for every single exercise. Uh, weightlifting could be a warrior. Uh, you could gain experience based on your distance and your pace. So, you know, the harder you work out, the more you level up. And then maybe you could have quests. So like, you know, you go out for a run and you encounter some bandits on the road and you, based on what level you are, uh, you might fight them and get some experience or some items. Um, and it would be similar to Pokemon Go or Dragon Quest Walk if you ever use that. So again, those uh, gamify exercise, going out and walking around. So just a really quick recap. Um, we went over email blasting. Uh, we went over betas. Uh, pop-ups and push notifications, and gamification. So yeah, um, anyway, I think that will do it for me today. Uh, thank you very much for stopping by and listening, and I hope that you can uh, implement all of these in your next project.